Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, number two seminar. Our guest today is uh, Professor Subramani Krishnan from uh, Chennai in India. He's our associate on his first visit to ICTP. Today, he'll be talking to us today about uh, Euclidean algorithm on number fields and related problems. Thank you, Subramani. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I thank ICTP for the support and opportunity to visit ICTP. Uh, today, I will talk about <coughs> equivalent algorithms on number fields and uh, equivalent algorithms and some uh, ID classes in number fields and, and its related problems. And in the end, if time permits, I will talk about uh, divisibility problems on class numbers. Um, Let's first define what is the including algorithm. So let uh, k be an algebraic number field for us, and OK be its ring of integers, the set of all ring of integers. And we know, uh, and we say that a non-negative function from OK to OK, non-negative function on OK is Euclidean if whenever for all elements A and B, uh, for B non-zero, there should be a Q and R so that A can be written as BQ plus R with uh, pi of R less than pi of B. Uh, we can clearly see that this is just a generalization of division algorithm what we used to learn uh, for example. <laughs> uh, the question is whether for a in general instead of okay whether if we have an integral domain r or uh, in particular for a ring of integers okay whether we have a equivalent function or not. So so why do you want to study about uh, equivalent algorithm? Suppose we have an equivalent algorithm for an integral domain r then that will imply that uh, that R is a PID and uh, PID implies V of D. Therefore, uh, it is interesting for us to study whether in you know, a given integral domain as a equivalent algorithm or not. So in, your, in this talk, we'll always concern about uh, number fields and its ring of integers. When we go for uh, the first non-trivial number field, uh, real quadratic field or a quadratic field in general, we have a natural norm function, which is a non-negative function on Q square root one or M square field integer. And we first ask the question, when will this function is an equivalent, equivalent function, whether we have a quotient and remainder always. So let's have some examples. Uh, we know that Z is uh, equivalent with respect to the modulus function. And uh, the set of the ring of all polynomial things is equivalent with respect to the function pi of P of X is one plus degree of P of X and zero, uh, whenever P of X is non-zero and zero if P of X is zero. And Gaussian integers are also equivalent with respect to the absolute value, square of the absolute value. So the question is whether how do you determine that a given integral domain is a Euclidean, uh, is Euclidean or not? So we briefly discuss uh, non-Euclidean uh, non-Euclidean number fields. For that, so let's recall that how we prove that uh, how we prove that uh, z is Euclidean. So if you have, uh, if I consider uh, if you consider the real line, so if you want to prove that we have a division algorithm, uh, we have a quotient and remainder for every A and B for B non-zero, we can see that the proof is essentially whether is essentially is equal and true if I take the interval of length zero B, whether this covers the entire the entire real line or not. So if this so uh, so mod modulus on Z is Euclidean is equivalent to saying that. The intervals of uh, of length b covers the entire real. So based on this observation, we can define a Euclidean minimum of uh, on any given number field k. So let's say that for any chi in k, we say that m of chi to be the infimum of norm of chi minus eta, where the infimum uh, for where the infimum runs over all eta belongs to OK. And we define m of k, which is Euclidean minimum of k, which is supremum of m of chi and uh, where chi runs over k. And by the definition, by so let's recall that what, what is equivalent algorithm. So if you have, we say that it is equivalent algorithm. We want to say that for every a and b, we want this to be whole. And when we divide uh, norm of b both sides, we can see that which is norm of a over b plus b is less than one, which is equivalent to saying that norm of a by b minus b. So this this is equivalent to saying that for every uh, in, for every element in K, there should be an element in OK so that this has size less than one. So generalizing that, we can we define including minimum and including minimum minimum at chi at K and including minimum of K. So 
So, so clearly, if m of k is less than one, clearly uh, k is non-Euclidean. If m of k, m of k is bigger than one, k is not non-Euclidean. And so, so you want to see what, how, what is the size of m of k for a given algebraic number. So, to start to find m of k, we can naturally uh, for any given number field k, we can we can embed into r to the power n. Uh, if k over if k is a number field of degree n, then you can embed k in r to the power n. Then we can naturally extend the uh, uh, definition of m of k and m of k uh, to m of k bar, which is r to the power n. So we can ask, we can, because it, it gives us a continuous function on m of k bar if we simply extend m of definition of m of k and m of uh, k to k bar. So that we, we ask the question whether what is a what is a supreme value for m of k bar, especially m of r to the power n. So if m of r to the power n is less than, by definition of m of k and m of k bar, Clearly, m of k is less than or equal to m of k bar. Therefore, we want to estimate what is m of k. So, there is a conjecture regarding uh, including minimum at k. It says that for a total, if suppose k is totally real algebraic number, if totally real, I mean all embeddings of k are totally real. There is no complex embedding for that. With the discriminant b, and if the degree is at least 5, then we can say that then the conjecture says that m of k is bounded above by root, 2, root d by 2 to the power n. And still, the conjecture is open except for some special cases and for non totally real number fields we don't know any conjectural uh, bound for also so it is only for the real quantity you said that degree is at least five or at most five you said something which was likely degree is at least three so So n is bigger than or equal to five. We have m of k is uh, to the power minus n square root of d. And if you go for real quadratic fields, we know m of k. So it says that uh, if m is uh, two three modulo four, then we know the exact value for the equivalent minimum. And for uh, which is mod m plus one over four for m is uh, a 3 modulo 4, we know that mod m of k is modulus of m plus 1 over square divided by 16 m. And with this proportion, we can see the upper and lower bound for the m of k for the imaginary quadratic field. And using this upper bound, um, uh, we have a, we have come, we know all non Euclidean imaginary quadratic field, which are one q square root m for m is equal to 1, 2, 3, 7, and 11. So there are nine imaginary quadratic fields, which are, uh, which are class number one. Only uh, out of nine, there are five of them are non Euclidean. In fact, if you ask a more general question, only these five Euclidean number, only these five imaginary quadratic for Euclidean with respect to any function. We cannot find uh, Euclidean function for uh, the remaining four imaginary quadratic fields. So let's recall uh, how the proof goes with an example. If you take q square root minus two, so we, we know that we want to cover, we want to know that m of k is less than one. So m of k is less than one is equivalent to saying that if we have a fundamental parallelogram for a number of fields, for fundamental parallelogram for the lattice, if we have unit circles about, if I have so m of k bar less than one is equal is say is 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 implied by the fact that if I take unit circles around the lattice points on the parallelogram, if this covers the entire fundamental parallelogram, then we can see that for this condition holds for every for every element x in k and we have a few in more k. So the so this I mean this is kind of geometrical proof to say that q square root minus two is non Euclidean. And if you go for q square root minus five, we can clearly say that uh, we can, can clearly see that the circles does not cover the fundamental parallel. So that we have a gap, therefore yeah, it is not non Euclidean. In fact, q square root minus five have class number two. For uh, real quadratic number fields, uh, we have a upper bound uh, for m of k for we have a lower and upper bound for that and using that and with uh, uh, and so we, we and also we know all complete classification of non Euclidean numbers too. there are only 16 of them uh, there are only 16 of them which are non Euclidean so but we can ask the questions we know that there are we know we know that 
we know that there are 16 of them are non euclidean but the question is okay norm is not uh, euclidean for euclidean algorithm for uh, real quadratic fields what about any other function can we have a function which is different from norm which is still equal so we uh, with uh, ramurthy and keshini was we noticed that with some mild conjectures on norm i will explain it later so mild conjectures uh, on real quadratic fields we can say that every real quadratic field of class number 1 is equal so class number 1 implies uh, euclidean for every real quadratic field but we assume that hard relative conjecture and we will be decrease back and forth. Conjecture says that if I take the set of all primes of p x in an arithmetic progression, and uh, so that two uh, p plus one is also prime, two p plus one is also prime has ordinality at least x over log x as it goes to infinity, and the Fritsch prime conjecture says that if I have a uh, a unit in the in OK star, and if we look for the set of all primes in X so that the epsilon to the power p minus one is one model of t square, and this cardinality is this little o of x over log x. So we assume this um, mild uh, we assume these statements, and we could able to see that uh, real number. In fact, we have equal algorithm for every class number one real correct. And also, we have certain families. We have exhibited a family, and we prove that if at all there is, uh, if we have the, if we have a class number one real quadratic field in that family, where d square root of d, where d is equal to a plus one square d square n square plus two uh, a plus one square n plus twenty three. If in this family also we have a, a Euclidean for every class number one quadratic. When you go for cubic number field. We have uh, we don't have a bound for m of k, we have, but we have a bound for m of k bar, and m of k bar says that if we have a uh, complex cubic number field, then m of k bar has a uh, has a bound, and if we consider totally real uh, cubic number field, we have the bound for m of k bar, which is one over eight square root of determinant of k, and if we consider the Galois cubic number field, and Smith proved that there are certain family there are certain family of cyclic cubic fields. Um, which are Euclidean, there are certain cyclic cubic fields which are not Euclidean. So he, he proved that if a, a cyclic cubic field with the conduct, if it has conductor f equal to the values 7, 9, and 13, and they are Euclidean with respect to now. If we have a, if the conductor is equal to 73, 79, and any conductor between 163 and 10 to the power 4, they are not normal. So we took up this problem and uh, we proved that all, all the fields what Smith listed, all of them are included with respect to with respect to some function. We don't know what is a we proved that there is the existence of the Euclidean algorithm for such fields. Then we move to uh, a quartic number field. If you go for quartic number field, uh, uh, what is a bound for m of k? And if suppose if uh, k is totally complex quartic field, then we know that we, we, we know the upper bound for non Euclidean number field. If the discriminant is less than, if the discriminant is bigger than that number 2302021117, then clearly k is not non Euclidean. And using that bound and a complete explicit computation, um, Linden proved that there are only two uh, such number fields which are non Euclidean. When you go for bicodratic field, um, uh, we also have complete classification of non Euclidean bicodratic fields. Usually, the color classification of non Euclidean number field is most of the time. It is complete only for if it has a complex symmetry. So for totally real number fields, there it is still open. Even in the basic case, uh, yeah. even in the uh, cubic case, it is still open. And you, even if you have a complex quadratic field, if it contains real quadratic fields, q square root two, you know, we know all non-Euclidean number fields. If it contains some other real quadratic fields and two ramified, we know only one which is non-Euclidean number field. If two is uh, if k contains a real quadratic field and uh, and also two does not ramify unless the second point if two only ramified ramification index two in k and initial degree two then also we know only four of them are equal number fields and if k is equal to that particular form i square root of a plus b a then we know a complete class we know a list of number fields are not equal 
And if in the case of totally complex quadratic field, uh, which does not have a real quadratic, quadratic uh, real quadratic subfield, we know the bound at least bound for a market. So we took up that problem for bi-quadratic number twins, and uh, with uh, Keshav Vas and Vishal Kesangali, we we proved that all imaginary bi-quadratic fields of class number one of the form Q square root m and Q square root n they are uh, Euclidean. And in fact, we could extend that result to all cyclic quadratic. So we uh, we proved that all cyclic quadratic fields, uh, uh, cyclic quadratic fields are also Euclidean if they have class number. So a yeah, quick. Uh, uh, a, a, a quick uh, a literature review about what about other number fields? We, I consider we consider up to number fields of degree four. What do we know about number fields of higher degree when we concern to non Euclidean number? So most of the theory relies on uh, only uh, we know most of the time we know only for number fields of prime degree. So for non prime degrees we don't uh, it's not well developed. So. So for the so we have the question suppose if we have a number field k over q and it has a degree l yeah, where l is a prime where l is a prime okay. then what can we say about whether k is equal or not and Mekong proved that he, he proved that whenever l is prime we, got, we can always have a constant c l so that when the discriminant is bigger than that constant is not non -equal. so for, so we know we know that above, of course assuming grh as I mean, GRH, we know that there is a for a, whenever we fix a L, we know that there is a constant. If the discriminant is above the constant, it is not non Euclidean. So, using the RSL, they themselves classified uh, cyclic cubic non Euclidean number fields of degree 5 and 7. And they proved that if the degree L is equal to these numbers 19, 31, 37, 43, then they are not non Euclidean. There is no number field of degree 19 which is non, non, not non Euclidean. So, even though the theorem, the, the the first theorem gives a bound, but how do we classify that? So how do you, the classification of uh, non Euclidean number fields when you have L is fixed, it is still widely open. We, so we need to use, we need to find an upper bound and then we need to know what is CL for a given. So then we can use a kind of computation to classify that, uh, and classify non Euclidean. Let's come back to the, uh, let's come back to the non Euclidean, uh, not non Euclidean stuff. So the first, so people always look, look for non-Euclidean function, non-Euclidean uh, number fields. So D. A. Clark, who first gave a number, who first showed that the real quality field Q square root of 69 is Euclidean, and but it is not non-Euclidean, where he gave an explicit function for that. He said that if we have if we define a function phi in this way, then this particular phi serves serves a purpose for us. And we can clearly see that this phi function is almost a norm function. So if when, whenever uh, when we have phi of a plus b square 1 plus square root of 69 over 2, whenever a b is not equal to 10 comma 3, the function he defined is a square plus a b minus something p square, which is a quadratic form, which is given by the norm well, norm map of q square root of 69. So only at the point 10 comma 3, it is it differs from the norm function. It is 26. So he cleverly constructs such a function so that it becomes a free today. So there is nothing special about 26. We can take any number bigger than 26 that will serve up. So to go for uh, non Euclidean, say, how do we prove that? How do we prove that existence of such an Euclidean number? So mode scheme gave a one to one correspondence between the Euclidean functions. Whenever Euclidean functions on OK, in fact, for any integral domain. Increasing sequence of sets. Given the one to one correspondence between the Euclidean function and the one increasing sequence of sets satisfying certain conditions, so that if we take the it will cover the complete integral term. If we have, we proved that if we have the increasing sequence of sets with certain conditions and which, which covers okay, then that will imply that we have a function phi, which is uh, which is a Euclidean function. So the construction says the following. So he, I'm not going to the detail of the construction. So I just explained the construction itself. So it's, he said, take A naught, which is union, zero union, the set of all units in the integral domain R, and let's define AI by inductively. AI is AI minus one union, all such elements in R, so that when we consider the quotient ring R over A, 
and if you consider the natural canonical map a minus one to R over here, this should be uh, this should be a such a thing. So he said that collect all such a's so that when we go from a minus one to R over here, that should be a such a thing. So clearly by the construction, by the construction, we can see that this a is an increasing sequence of sets. And if this covers okay, we are done. So for example, if you take Z, um, the A naught is 0, comma minus 1, comma 1. And then A1, so we look, we need to look for uh, integer so that when you go from A naught to Z over A, that should be a subject map. And it is clearly, we can see that A naught contains 0, minus 1, 1. Therefore, A1 should contain integers from minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. So A2 is numbers from uh, minus 4, minus 7 to plus 4 and so on. And this says that we can clearly see that this covers C, therefore that will guarantee that Z is not, Z is equal. Z is equal. This is another way to show that Z is equal. So, uh, so using Mortskin's criteria, uh, Weinberger proved that if you assume ZRH, then we can always have an increasing sequence of sets which covers okay. So we covers okay. Uh, in fact, the precise result says that if we have if we, if we have all primes in this set, if we have all primes in this set, all primes, all prime ideals in this set, prime elements in this set, then that's, there is some n so that an is equal to 1. And he assumed, precisely assumed ZRH to show that all primes are in 1. All primes are in A2. And therefore, by Motskin construction, because Motskin says that uh, if this covers OK, then K is equal to So by Motskin, K is equal to so to remove GRH, so all uh, all our work so far uh, is restricted to a number fields of small degree and to remove GRH from the interface. So to remove GRH, we need to show that how do we put all primes in the set here? How, we, how do we make sure that all primes are in the set here? The first uh, non-conditional uh, uh, non result says that if we have certain number field K and satisfying and if you consider the ring of S integers, um, where S, uh, ring of S integers, let's take S be a set of all primes of K. There are finite primes and infinite primes. And S contains all the infinite primes. And we, we take set of uh, set of all X in OK, so that the order of X with respect to the prime P is at least zero. So for all primes, not in S. So we fix a finite number of places of K, and then we look for all integers, which is not zero. And then, if we consider such ring of S integers OS, yes, and if the size of S is sufficiently large, if it is at least maximum of uh, phi and phi, big phi and two times the degree minus three, and if K has uh, if, if K has a real number t, or it can be the gth root of empty, where G is uh, the GCD of norm of P minus one for every prime, finite prime in S, yes, then such a ring of integers is equal. So here we can see that there is no assumption on GRH. And to remove uh, for the for the actual number field k for the actual ring of integers k, uh, Clark and Ramurthy uh, into, introduced this concept of admissible primes. So so we, uh, remember uh, we want to see that whether a two contains all prime ideals or not. To in order to say that a two contains all prime ideals or not, they modified Morskin's construction. They modified the Morskin construction and they boost the admissible primes. So that when we consider the sequence here, that A2 uh, contains all primes in uh, all, the, this set, corresponding set here contains all primes, prime ideas. So that is their idea. So they introduced introduce that set of admissible prime and they studied, uh, they, couldn't, uh, they studied the problem. So what is an admissible prime? Select so admissible set of primes. So let, uh, let's take uh, pi one, pi two, pi s, be distinct non-associated prime elements. And we say that the set pi one pi two pi s is admissible if if we consider a beta, a beta is pi one to the power a one, pi two to the power a two, pi s to the power a s, where a is a non-negative integer. Then, if you go for OK model of beta star, then the natural map from OK star to OK model of beta star should be such a thing. And this should be true for every integer a one a two a s. If this if this is true, then we can say that a one a two a s is an admissible set. And in fact, using this, they proved that if a totally real model, they proved that we have, if we have a totally real uh, Galois extension, and if it has yes number of admissible primes, where um, the, num the size of the yes is modulus of n of k minus four plus one, then okay is equal. So there are n of k is a degree of k over q. If 
if a real quadrant, if a real, total real Galois extension has sufficient number of admissible terms, then OK is equal if it is PA. And also they proved that every finite Galois extension of unit rank bigger than 3 also holds true. Uh, AD implies Euclidean. And for abelian extension, they have a sharper result. They proved that abelian, if you have k over q is abelian extension of degree 1. If you have s number of admissible prime, we also that r plus s is bigger than or equal to 3, then OK is equal. So this leaves us to consider uh, number fields of smaller degrees. So smaller rank. Smaller rank. So they themselves consider the real quadratic case and they proved that q square root 14 is equal. So, so so this is the first, this is the uh, long standing conjecture to prove that q square root 14 is equal here. Special about q square root 14 is it is the first uh, real, smallest real quadratic field which is not non Euclidean, but it is a PA. So, so they proved that that q square root 14 is Euclidean by exhibiting two admissible primes for that, which is 5 minus square root 14 and 3 minus 2 times square root 14. And in fact, they proved they taken all the real quadratic fields of discriminant up to 500. And they proved that class number one in place. So recall that we we consider the same around the line of thought. We consider the problem and we prove uh, the research, which I already mentioned earlier. And and for the cubic and for the cubic case, we proved that we extended the smooth result using the same line. So recently we recently we thought about biquadratic fields. In fact, multiquadratic fields. So we can think of multi-quadratic fields, the problem, uh, multi-quadratic fields, but by the result of Ramurthy and Clark, uh, Ramurthy and Harper, it says that if R plus S is bigger than or equal to 3, then we have a, at least, if R is sufficiently large, we don't need to think about it. Therefore, when we go for multi-quadratic field, that result restricts ourselves to the bi-quadratic field. So and we, we, uh, we consider the bi-quadratic fields of class number one. And these are the list of bi-quadratic fields, which are class number one. And the pink number, uh, uh, the pink colored ones are known that they are non Euclidean, and others are not known whether they are non Euclidean or not. So we proved that they are in fact Euclidean. So to prove, so this is a precise result which I already mentioned earlier. So to prove that result, we want to know that we want to know the uh, structure of the unit group, and in all of this, surprisingly, in all of the non -Euclidean, not non Euclidean bicoletic fields, the uh, they have, they always have rank one, and with the torsion part, they use only the torsion part differs. The torsion part is either C4, C2, C6, and C10. So based on, so to exhibit a admissible prime, so we want to know, we want, uh, we, exp we want to construct a, we, we prove the following proportion, so that this proportions helps us to prove that uh, individually each bicoletic field, what we are considering is a uh, has admissible set, and that will imply that. Uh, Considering the quadratic quadratic number field is equal. So, uh, so the the proportion goes as follows. If I take a number field L, and if I take a y and which of integers, suppose if I have two prime ideals Q1 and Q2, and they are unramified over Q and with uh, initial degree one, and with prime norm Q1 and Q2. If we have these prime ideals Q1 and Q2 and rational primes Q1 and Q2 satisfies all these four conditions, then we can say that Q1 and Q2 is an invisible, admissible prime. So if, so of course, if we, if we, and the proportion 2 assumes that OL has the um, torsion group C2 cross Z. And proportion 4 for the number field K with the torsion for C4 cross Z. And with the same, uh, we look for Q1, Q2 satisfying the three conditions mentioned here in proportion 3. If we have uh, Q1 and Q2 satisfying proportions, we can say that uh, Q1, Q2 is an admissible prime. For uh, number fields of uh, number field with the torsion part C6, we have a slightly modified conditions for such a number fields. For C10, we have we can see that only the conditions uh, two and four is changing uh, frequently in all the proportions two, three, four, five. So basically, we want to show that if we have an admissible prime, we want to look for we look for uh, prime ideals Q1 and Q2, of course. With restricted conditions, they are not general prime ideal. They should be unramified, and with the initial degree one, with prime with the initial degree one, and that prime number should satisfy certain conditions. So let's recall. Uh, let's uh, I just outline the proof of proportion three. So.
initial time we want to say that uh, OK over P1 to the power A1, P2 to the power A2 star is subject to. So the outline is so what uh, so the strategy of the proof is to consider because P1 and P2 are distinct prime ideals, they are open to each other by Chinese elementary theorem. We can consider P1 to the power A1, which is isomorphic to OK by so what we wanted what we proved is that we have taken uh, clear so remember we are looking for primordial which are odd prime so when we have a primordial with odd prime now this is a cyclic group both of them are cyclic group so we we are looking for an element in here so that it maps to an element alpha comma one where alpha is a generator for this group and one uh, this group and we are looking for some other element which maps to one comma beta where beta is a generator for this group so, if we would be able to find such an element in OK star which maps to element here, then we can clearly say that uh, our, our epsilon to the power A plus B maps to alpha comma B. So the, the strategy is to produce strategy, strategy is to produce uh, whether we have such a unit in OK star which maps elements here. So this these conditions follows by what we are assuming. So we, we assume such conditions. So we assume conditions one, two, three, four, so that this, I mean, so that we can, by with computation, we can have these two equations to be good. So that will make sure that we have uh, these two conditions that will imply that we have a map. So if you go for the out, uh, if you go for the uh, proof of proving that bicolonic field is Euclidean, so we we'll, uh, let's exhibit let's exhibit with an example with the first bicolonic fields what we are considering. So we consider the bicolonic field Q square root minus one and square root minus eleven, and we we need to look for primes which satisfies the four conditions what we have listed in proportion three. So here in this case we can take P one is one fifty seven and P two is five and look for a, its prime decomposition and if we take any prime ideal in the prime field composition for, for, P, for P1 or OK, we take the first prime ideal in the prime, de, prime ideal decomposition. And for P2 OK, we take the first prime ideal in the prime ideal, de, prime ideal, de, ideal decomposition. And with computation, we have checked that, we, we, we simply check that whether this uh, P1 and P2 satisfies the condition or not. So that is, that's, uh, that's what we did in the proof. So we check that they all satisfy the conditions. And that will say that this particular number field, uh, the first root square root minus one and square root eleven is. Equal. So these are the admissible primes for all the bipolar fields what we listed earlier. And this is admissible prime. So for uh, for cyclic quartic fields, we need to deal with uh, the same along the line, but with the different proportions and with the uh, different computation technique. And recently with Ushak Sangali, we considered uh, the last uh, uh, smallest number field, what we are interested in, six digit number fields uh, with their uh, unit triangle less than three. And we proved that all such uh, six digit number fields with the unit triangle less than three are equal. So this, in fact, this completes kind of all abelian Galois number fields of class number one uh, with, uh, with the unit triangle less than three are equal. So this completes the program. So then we go to the second part of the talk. In the second part, it, uh, we consider the generalization of Euclidean algorithm to the ideal class. So so remember Euclidean algorithm means that in the norm case, we, uh, it's equivalent to saying that for every x in k, we look for a element alpha in O k so that whether x minus alpha is less than one. So that is equivalent to saying that whether we have an, for every x, we have a, whether we have an alpha, so the n of x minus alpha less than one. So then, so let's talk, generalize this, this notion, this particular, in, this particular, particular inequality and in saying that instead of, we can think of one as norm of OK, norm of OK is, uh, is one. So this, he, a uh, simple observation, uh, uh, I mean, a clever observation says that he, he 
we replace norm of 4k by norm of an i and of course we are looking for alpha in c here we are looking for alpha in ok and here we look for alpha in c it says that we said that an integral domain c is said to be non euclidean if for every x in k whether we have an alpha in c so that norm of x minus alpha is less than norm of c so why do we need to have such a function what, what is uh, what is the advantage of considering restricting to alpha to c and he himself proved that if you have such a norm function then the ideal class c is a generator for the class and it, it proves two such things so it, proves, it, it, it generates a it generates ok star and it proves that ok star is cyclic and also it gives a uh, generator for the cyclic. Even he defined a more general definition. He said that let's take any dedicant domain R, in fact, any dedicant domain R and I with a set of all integral domains. Unlike the Euclidean algorithm case, here the definition works for the dedicant domain, not for any integral domain. So let's take a R be a dedicant domain and I with a set of all integral domains. And let's take a ideal C in R. And he said that we say that C is Euclidean. If we have a function psi from i to w, where w is any yeah, well ordered set, so that whenever for any ideal i in i and for every element x in i in was c not in c, there should be a y in c so that psi of x minus y i c in was less than psi of y. So if we have such a function, so so the, whatever we have in the definition, he try to generalize this this particular part. So when we put uh, when we replace psi by norm and all these things in that, it is very clear that. Yeah, we can see that uh, what the definition here is generalizing the notion. So if we have if we have such a function on C, if we have such a function psi, then we say that yeah, an ideal C is equal. So the question is, if I have an ideal C in an integral domain R, and if I consider any ideal in ideal class C, if I consider the ideal class, and if I consider any ideal in ideal class C, B in C, then B is also equal. So it is. We can see by tracing the definition, we can see that not only C is Euclidean, but any ideal class C is also C also Euclidean. And he himself proved that if you have a Euclidean function, then uh, every element in the ideal class is Euclidean. And in fact, the ideal class generates H pair in, in particular C class group is it. The question here also the similarly for Euclidean number three, you have the question whether the converse is true, whether we have a, a, a of course, if you have a Euclidean function, if you have a Euclidean function psi. Psi implies that class group is cyclic. So he himself asked the question, what about the converse? Whether we have a converse or not? And he gave counter example for that. He proved that um, the only counter example exists. So he proved that if we take the imaginary quadratic field q squared minus b, where d is equal to these values, and they are not, they don't have any Euclidean ID class at all, even though the class group is cyclic. And with assuming GRH, he proved that they are the only case. If we take any other number field other than imaginary quadratic field, class cyclic implies we have such a function. We have such a function and an ideal class so that such a function is an uh, is an Euclidean function on the ideal class. So it recently in Graves proved that uh, he want to remove, she wants to remove uh, uh, the assumption of GRH and she proved that suppose if I have uh, ideal class C and it generates the class group. And if the ideal class C contains sufficient number of prime ideas, we can see that it's kind of generalizing the most uh, so uh, Monskin's idea. So he, he proved that if the ideal class C contains sufficient number of prime ideals, more precisely, if I have the number of prime ideals uh, up to X, norm of P up to X, so that P belongs to the ideal class. And so that the canonical map from OK star to OK by P, OK, OK star, OK star to OK by P star is on to, if we have the canonical map is, Onto if 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 that set the cardinality of such set is at least x over log x square and she proved that c is equal and later Graves and Ramurthy proved that if I have a x, if using um, above result they proved that if I have a Galois extension with a Hilbert class field uh, uh, Galois extension with the HKP the Hilbert class field of k and the Hilbert class field is uh, Abelian over Q and, of, and with the rank of OK star is at least four, then cyclic implies uh, IQ. So, so they, they proved at least, I want to say that there are some uh, subclass of, they, they proved that if I, if I have a case satisfying this condition, then we have the converse part. And there are refinement of these results recently. That, uh, so, and with the uh,
Chaitra Chattopadhyaya, we want to be, we are going to prove that explicitly giving a number field so that a non principal ideal class is, has equity. So, we want to, uh, our aim was to prove that we have explicit, uh, uh, as I said earlier, we have, uh, we have refinement of these results, uh, uh, removing the uh, Hilbert class field conditions on, and uh, specific, there are sp results on specific classes. And we, so we considered bicoronic fields of this form. Q square root Q and Q square root K R, where Q and K, Q, K are prime, prime numbers and satisfying certain conditions, they are not mathematical progression. And we, uh, we assume that it has class number two, but our aim was to prove that the non principal ideal class is, has Euclidean ideal class. I want to say that non we have non principal ideal class. And also we consider bicoronic fields of this form Q square root 2, Q square root PQ, where P and Q are one model of four. And here also we want to say that assuming HK2 is two, we want to say that non principal ideal class is. So the proof uh, needs a following lemma. We want to know the conductor of this. Clearly, the bicoronic field is an abelian extension. The Kronecker weber theorem, we know that uh, it, it contains in a cyclotomic uh, field. We want to know the, what is that uh, cyclotomic field. We want to know the degree of that. So here, by following, uh, by, uh, following this uh, map uh, tower of fields, we can clearly see that Q square root Q, Q square root K are contained in K, what we are considering. And because Q is, by assumption, Q is three model of four, uh, therefore it has conductor four Q. K and R are both one model of four, therefore it has conductor K R. And uh, uh, by, by uh, therefore, if, if we take the K, the number field K, it should be contained in the composition of Q square root four Q and Q square root K R. That means that K contains in Q zeta, Q square root four Q and Q square root K R. And the converse part, we can clearly see that uh, uh, by tracing the formula, we can we can see that uh, if, uh, Q square root, the composition is contained in K aspect. Uh, so uh, the idea is K contained in the composition of Q square root four Q, zeta four Q and Q square root uh, Q zeta K R, and uh, they are equal. So so we proved that they are equal, and that will imply that the number field we are considering has conductor four Q K R. And the second uh, uh, lemma we wanted, we wanted to prove that the explicit Hilbert class field for the uh, bicoratic field. And um, if we consider this, uh, the K prime, the, the triquadratic field, Q square root Q square root K R square root K square root R, we, we wanted to prove that K prime is a, is a Hilbert class field of K. And because it has, uh, the K prime is a quadratic extension of K, and we are assuming that HK has class number two. And, we wanted to say that we simply need to say that a k prime over k is an unramified extension. And also we can see that both k and k prime are unram are infinite primes. So we only need to say that that uh, ramification doesn't happen in the finite primes. So they clearly they are uh, they are ramified at the infinite primes. So to prove that they are uh, ramified at the infinite finite primes, we consider the we, we note that k is contained in k prime and k prime is contained in two zeta four q k r. And the only prime in the cyclotomic field Q zeta four QKR, they are ramified if the prime radius lies above two QKR. Therefore, if at all there is a prime in K prime which ramifies, the prime radius in K prime which ramifies, that should be a prime radius lies in above two QKR. Therefore, we therefore it is sufficient to show that the primes in K lies above two QKR, they are all unramified prime. So here we consider the I outline the proof for the case uh, for the prime two. We consider the tower of fields, what we had just here, considered here. Um, uh, Q zeta 4Q are contained, contains K prime, K prime contains K, K contains Q, and we consider the uh, two in uh, two P2, P3, P4, respectively, the primes in the uh, respective fields there. And we want to show that P3 over P2 has ramification index one. And to show that, we consider the another bicoratic field, uh, L1, Q square root K and square root R. And by the condition on K and R, we can see that this has ramification index one, and and this uh, therefore the ramification index of P three over P two is this is maximum two because that uh, degree of the extension is two. Therefore, by multiplicity of the ramification index, we can see that the the ramification index of P three over P two is maximum by two, and but that that means that P three over two is two, but P two over two is at least two because. Uh, K contains uh, uh, K and R are one model of four. Therefore, this ramification index is at least two. That will imply that P3 over P2 has ramification index one. 
So that will prove that any prime ideal in K rise above two should be a uh, should be a should be unramified in K. So this will prove that uh, K prime over K is unramified at the prime ideals rise above two, and we can prove similarly for other primes Q, K, or S. So with this, with this we want to use this result to show our field is uh, uh, the field what we are considering is uh, in fact the non-principal ideal class is Euclidean. So we have proved that. If you have an ordinary real number field with unit rank at least three, then if you have an integer u uh, satisfying the conditions, then for any then the set of all prime ideals of prime degree one uh, with the norm of p is u modulo l, uh, uh, so that the canonical map from minus one comma e to ok p star is subjective is at least x over log x square. So this condition is true for at least one of these e one e two. So she proved that this is true for at least one of these e1, e2, e3, if, if we choose cleverly u and here. So, so to use this result, remember we want to say that we want to say that we want to know that non-principal ideal class is included. That means that we want to make sure that anyway, this is true. We want to make sure that to choose u so that whenever I have a prime ideal p satisfying the conditions in the in the set, that should that prime ideal should be in the non-principal ideal class. So how do we make sure that? So to make sure that we consider uh, we, we consider uh, we want to find a u so that uh, whenever we have a prime ideal in u modulo 4 qkr and uh, if it's sorry for the uh, the notation here the if the initial degree of the if the initial degree if we have these conditions so i want to know I, whenever i have and my claim our claim is so I have a u so that if I have a prime ideal in u modulo r, and if I have a so uh, if I have a prime p in k and p prime in k bar, the ramif the initial degree of this is two, the initial degree of this is one, and the initial degree of this is two. So we want to find such a u so that this is true for every prime in that metric progression. So if we have such a p, what why do we need such a condition? So if we have such a p, if p prime satisfying the initial degrees are one and two. So by class field theory, we can make sure that this prime ideal P lies in the non principal ideal class. So that is our motto. So now we need to find a uh, U such a U. So how do we find that? To do that, let's consider all prime ideals in K, which splits completely. I call this XK1. All prime ideals in K prime, which splits completely. K prime is HK1. Aspect of that. All prime ideals of all primes here, which splits completely in K prime. And we know that uh, by again class with the chapter of density theorem, we can see that xk1, xk, and the hk prime, uh, the, the set xk1 has density 1 over 4, and the x hk1 has density 1 over 8. Therefore, the difference has density 1 over 8. 1 over 8. So remember, we want to know, we want to know, we want to find a, a prime a integer u satisfying these conditions. So the uh, so we can we we translated that conditions what we record into uh, uh, into this. So this is equivalent to saying that we look for primes so that we have a, that Q what we consider in the periodic field is a residue model of P and then K and R are non-residue model of P. So here that's how the non-residue residue class plays a role here. So we want a P so that when we reduce Q model of P that should be a residue and K and R should be non-residue model of P. And of course we need the conditions on U, the conditions on the hypothesis of the Krebs result uh, that should satisfy the GCD of U and 16 QPR should be one, and GCD of U minus one over to 16 KQR should be one. So uh, these two conditions we, we can translate into nine and ten, and then we want to see whether we have an integer U satisfying nine and ten. So here we make use of Pollock's result. Pollock said that whenever we have a uh, Whenever we have a prime, uh, whenever we have prime bigger than or equal to five, we have a non-residue uh, less than less than that prime. Whenever we, uh, which is conformed to three modulo four, we make use of that result to find primes p one, p two, p three. All of them are non-residues modulo q, k, or respectively, so that the above equation nine and ten can be solved by solving the lab. So if we solve eleven and if we find x naught which satisfies all the confirmed conditions in eleven and that so if I take an integer which satisfies the simultaneous equations 11, that will serve our purpose of it. Then we can show that, uh, then we, we can show that 
any u, any uh, any p in the arithmetic proportion u modulo 4 p by r, which satisfies all the conditions what we supposed to know uh, to satisfy that a non principal ideal class is Euclidean. So that will satisfy, um, we can check, we can check the computation. That will say that the non principal ideal class, what we are considering is in fact uh, uh, have sufficient number of prime ideals, and that will prove that non principal uh, that is equal. I stop here. In those results where one has to assume the generalized Riemann hypothesis, how exactly does it enter into the proof of the? So yeah, I mean, so we, we, it proves that we want to know that that say J two contains sufficient number of primes. That means we want to the, the, the if we could go for A two by definition, we want to look for prime primitive roots. So we want to know uh, how many primes are there, which uh, looks like a primitive roots in that. So then we assume GRH to say that we have sufficient number of uh, prime ideals so that it has a primitive. So if you look for that uh, condition A2, when we look at discuss, A2 is set of all elements so that when we go from A1 to A2, all elements uh, okay over here, that should be a certain element. So we have a, this says that we have a primitive in here. So uh, that means we want to know, uh, we want to know the set of all elements, set of all prime ideal which have a primitive in here. Want to know the, uh, counting the all such prime ideal which are. So it's basically the GRS comes into the picture to count the number of primitive roots. So it gives you a better, a better qualitative order. estimates for these things. Yes. And also with the better order of magnitude that. Yes, the, yes. Better order of order of magnitude so that the prime ideals are belongs to. So I suggest we take the conversation to the coffee next because so let's thank Subraman again for the talk. Now now I think